Oh my god. That's actually urine. Hey guys, just when you think you've seen absolutely everything in the car world, then this arrives. A 2005 Ford GT. This thing's been sitting outside for over five years. Dust, dirt, grime, mouse poo, spiderweb, you name it, it is in this vehicle. I need to get it cleaned up and off to a new home very soon. But I do know someone that might be able to help me with the process. This is just so beautiful. God, Connecticut. That is, that is nice. Today on this episode of Try and Protect. The 2005 Ford GT is similar in appearance to the original iconic GT40, but this one is bigger, wider, and four inches taller than its predecessor, and it came with a 5.4 liter supercharged modular V8, pushing 550 horsepower, a top speed of 205, quarter mile in just 11.8 seconds, while tipping the scales at nearly 3,500 pounds. Of the 1900 produced in 2005, approximately 503 were made in white, and nearly 93% of all the cars came with racing stripes. Now, before you post a YouTube comment about how could somebody possibly let a car of this value get this dirty, much like the Countach garage find from a few years ago, it's important to understand the entire story before casting him into the YouTube bin of fire, because the previous owner did actually love the car, but sadly, he suddenly passed away and his family, understandably, had other priorities. Now they've reached out to me to get this back into showroom shape. The tires are dry rotted. And they want to find someone who will love this piece of automotive history as much as their dad did. All my memories are coming back. This is like, you probably get one of these in your life. Look at this dude, there's like a pound of dirt inside the... I mean, this is a detailing dream as far as I'm concerned. Wow, look at the headlights dude. It's scuffed up. I'm gonna rip this thing into pieces and put it all back together. Bro, there's rust on the windshield wiper. So with all that being said, once I got it off the trailer and into the studio, I called a buddy of mine who knows a thing or two about GTs and selling cars. Perfect. But I'm also hearing myself. Like like normal. Like when you talk and you hear yourself like talk. <laughs> yes. All right, Doug, thanks for coming on, man. Long time no see, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is exciting. No worries, no worries. We have a 2005 Ford GT. Now this thing's been sitting outside for years, probably six or seven years. 2,500 oh. miles, absolutely covered in rat poo. There's leaves, <laughs> there's everything you could ever imagine. And I know you have one of these. Yeah. You think you'd ever see something like this left in a driveway? No, no, that's crazy. I just drove mine today. I am obsessed with mine and I keep it, you know, perfect. Like everybody who has one of those, I can't believe that there is one that has been neglected. Now, the big thing is I have to clean this up and we're looking to sell it. I would love to have you come drive this after it's clean when we put it on cars a bit. You cool with that? Yeah, totally. Let's do it. That sounds great. <laughs> okay, our first step under normal conditions is to lift the car up, remove the wheels, power wash, everything. We can't do that because the lift is not going to accommodate it. We actually have lift points underneath here, totally fine. But in the back, it's actually under the engine and the lift can't accommodate that. So we're going to leave it on the ground. Later on, I'm going to take the wheels off when we take this to actually get an oil change at the dealership. Yikes. I'll pop the wheels off, take it down to Proformance, get those worked on. But for now, we're just gonna power wash everything and see what we have. First, I removed the battery to see what was on the bottom of the frunk. Look at all this that was, oh my gosh. Now, initially I thought I was gonna just power wash all this away. It's not gonna happen. I, I have to vacuum the frunk, which is pretty insane. As you can see, there's just stuff everywhere. And if I hit it with a power washer, it's gonna turn to this kind of goopy, muddy junk. I won't be able to get out uh, from underneath here. So first, we're gonna vacuum. Oh, 
Next, I power wash the frunk and the engine compartment. Check this out. This is even after vacuuming. As soon as I hit it with the air, all this junk came out. And we still vacuum. Can you imagine what's in the vacuum right now? It's crazy. So power washing right now is a little bit of like a triage situation. I just need to see what's really bad and what's not. Now I find interesting is along these rails here, you can see this brown stuff. That's actually urine from mice kind of going back and forth. And they tend to walk around just the edges and there's not a lot of edges here other than these support bars. So you can see there's just marks all up and down the, the uh, support braces. I, I'd never seen anything like this in my life. this car going ah. next i soaked everything in brute wheel soap and boost to loosen up as much of the caked on grime as possible before the actual agitation wash After my first wash was done, I then coated everything in Titan 12 degreaser because the oily sort of greasy grime just kept coming and coming every time I would wipe it. So when you encounter oil-based stains or issues like this, using a higher pH cleaner can help loosen its grip it's on coming. the surface by making the oil more soluble in water so it can just be washed away easier with the power washer. Now, just as a point of reference, I also use Plum Wheel Cleaner, which is a stronger alkaline product on the wheels and wheel wells and the heavier greased areas. And I did that from a pivot bottle. And even after the first wash, look how much grime started to dissolve without even agitating. This is how the chemical is doing its job. It's pretty wild. After about two minutes of letting it dissolve the grime, I decided to foam the entire car once again during the agitation phase of the wash because I wanted as much lubrication as possible because I really needed to scrub a little bit harder than I normally would, let's say, on a normal preservation detail. There is nothing normal about this, so I need as much lubrication as possible. After hours, I mean literally I, hours of washing and scrubbing, I used the Master Blaster to help chase out the trapped dirt, leaves, and acorns that I just couldn't get with the power washer. At this stage in the process, I'm not really concerned about drying the paint necessarily. I'm more concerned about using compressed air and potentially damaging the material as I go in and blow everything. So in this case, I'm using the Master Blaster to blow out the leaves and the acorns, all that. But at the same time, I just don't want to damage the material more than it already is. This blower is actually manufactured in America by hand and ironically, right down the road from where I am. So it's super cool. Make sure you support our local detailers and companies that make products for us. Check out their website for vacuums and blowers of all sizes and use code AMMO at checkout for 10% off any of their website purchases. They're really good people. Check them out. With the outside of the car somewhat clean now, we still have a lot more to go. I focused on the interior by removing the seats and much of the floorboards. Simple as simple gets right there. Step one is to vacuum up the dirt, acorns, and the nests. Next, I hit every crevice with compressed air to blow out the trap acorns and door seals. Now, because I pulled the seats out, I actually used the aerator this time filled with lather to cover larger areas quickly with an interior brush. And then I went back in and steam machined everything to safely remove the bacteria and the remaining mouse poop. I repeated the same exact process on the rest of the interior.
A few hours later, I focused on the exterior restoration. For that, I'm using a wool cutting pad on a Rupes 21 machine because the paint is just so swirled out and just scratched, which of course is gonna require a follow-up polishing, so I had a lot to do. Now for step two, I'm polishing the paint. The first step was to compound, and the reason that we needed to compound first was because the paint is incredibly hard, and there's actual scratches and deep gouges in here that I needed a lot more abrasion, a lot more compound to get through. Now the byproduct of doing something like that to level it, have it look fantastic, is you have these swirls that are left behind. Very, very common, normal. So that means you have to follow up with a second step, which we're doing right now. That is a foam pad polish, and that's gonna remove the swirls that were installed by the compound. When I'm done, the paint looks absolutely razor flat. It's perfect. I'm, I'm really liking the way this is coming out. After all of that, believe it or not, we're gonna wash it a third time. I know it sounds crazy. The first wash was just to kind of figure out what we we're doing. The second one, I really thought I got everything. And now the third one is because as I'm vibrating the paint, ooh, and the machine's going up and, uh, and, it, and it's vibrating the panels, it's actually kicking out more and more dirt. Plus, I took the battery out because I wanted to make sure that we were safe there. But when you take the battery out, you can't get the door open because these are electric doors. So I'm gonna put the battery back in, open the doors, and then I have to clean out the door jams. And I can see in here, there's still a little bit of gunk. And I'll, maybe I'll get like a Will Woolly or some sort of brush in there to kind of agitate it down. So we're gonna do a third wash. After all of that, I'm gonna take it to the dealership so that it can get serviced, put some new tires on that we just got in, and then take this thing for a drive. With the paint now restored, it's now time to bring some life to the faded and yellowed out headlights. This is definitely the first time I've ever seen oxidized polycarbonate headlights on a supercar that's been sitting out in the sun a long time. Usually they're in garages or under covers, et cetera. So in this case, the UV inhibitors in the protective clear coat have just faded away from sitting outside and just getting beat up by the sun over the years. Step one is to mask off the surrounding paint. Then I used a 1500 sanding disc on a palm sander with a few spritz of water. While I was sanding, notice the yellowish sort of brownish color of the sanding slurry. That is indicative of oxidation or the burnt up clear coat coming off during the sanding process. I repeated the same steps with the 1500 again because it was pretty bad. Then I switched to a 3000 grit disc to remove the previous sanding marks of the 1500. Afterwards, I compounded with the 21 and then I polished with the 21 for a much cleaner and clearer headlight. With the paint and the interior much cleaner, I then circled back to clean the door jams and the paint one last time. For the door jams, I'm using Ammo Plum Wheel Cleaner, a wheel brush, and then what I do is I take the tip off the nozzle of the power washer for what I call close quarter rinsing so it doesn't spray everywhere in the interior before starting the last, of, or at least what I thought would be the last of its many washes. Third time is a charm.
Afterwards, I conditioned everything in the car, including the parts, the seats, man. These things needed some major love with ammo mousse, and it required a few applications because it honestly was just so dry and soaked everything up. So I had to keep reapplying it until it filled up. With that in mind, always remember to buff the leather after a few minutes just to maintain that matte yet moisturized finish. You don't want it to be glossy, so make sure you buff it. While I was allowing Ammo Moose a few minutes to kind of soak into the really parched seats, I noticed that the back of the seats had this polished carbon that was a little dull. So I repolished it with a three inch pneumatic yellow pad and exfoliate polish on there, then applied Ammo Blush just to protect it. And afterwards I reinstalled everything and just called it a night. I was absolutely beat. Bright and early the next morning, the car looked much better, but nowhere close to being done. We flatbedded the GT over to Brewster Ford for service and put her right up on the alignment rack once we got there. Big shout out to Ken Voltz, the owner of Brewster Ford, and the team for accommodating the GT on such short notice and for allowing me to do what you are about to see in a minute. Oh my gosh. First up, Austin removed the oil filter, which was frozen over the plastic post that holds the filter in place before replacing it with a fresh filter. We're moving this out of here this way because it was completely frozen in here. Which is odd, yes? Yes, very, very strange. Never seen that before. This thing has that had been sitting for quite some time. Next, he removed the under tray and its thousand screws, oh, nice. revealing this. <laughs> this is pretty nasty. Wow. Uh, oh my gosh. Well, like a little, a little nugget of something. <laughs> I don't want to know. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. With the oil now draining, I asked Austin if he could remove the front splitter as well. When that comes down, you're getting a face full of oh, yeah. urine. Yeah, more acorns. With everything removed and now organized, I asked the boys if I could power wash the undercarriage of the car. I was freaking out at this point. They said yes, but I'd have to actually put down tarps over the lift to avoid pee and poo smell sort of getting in these trapped areas and just like reeking for days. I said, no problem. So with a borrowed dealership power washer and the hot water now flowing, I went nuts on the undercarriage with a degreaser. I just let it soak for a few minutes. And then I went outside, power washed and scrubbed the trays before heading back inside and power washing the undercarriage. And it was disgusting. Woo! I'm like all the way. So when I first came under here, I was literally pulling out just leaves and junk everywhere. So we power washed everything. It came down. It looks absolutely spectacular. I think maybe all the leaves we're protecting under here is very shiny. Looks absolutely perfect. We're gonna clean up uh, the under trays, put them back on. Then we're gonna take the wheels off, blast down the performance, get them refinished, put some new tires on here. This thing's almost ready to go. In this process, I also found somebody I was looking for. Come here, look what I found. I knew it. With everything clean and drying, and while Austin was replacing the oil, he was also replacing the air filter at the same time, which is a common home for rodents. And sure enough, a reserve of acorns and nuts and all kinds of junk was found here as well. Oh. Oh. Next, we removed the wheels, which I'd never done before on the original six spokes. To do it, first push the center cap in and then twist. This is going to reveal the plastic twist off cap. Underneath that, it holds the three spoke plastic chrome bits 
over the lug nut. So it's a little bit of an intricate thing, but it's pretty cool how it comes off. I also asked Austin if he could remove the ignition covers and valve covers so I could get them repainted along with the wheels. The next day with all four wheels removed and then replaced with the Gunny Wheel Universal Donuts, it's a really cool thing where you can put them on and move the car around while you're working on the wheels. Again, it also looks kind of crazy with orange on a Ford GT, but anyhow, I packed the Taycan with the dismounted wheels, the fresh rubber and valve covers that were just removed and then headed down to Performance Industries to get everything cleaned up. I showed Evan, Will, and the team what was needed, and they got right to it with the water and sand blaster slurry in the prep box to remove the surface level corrosion. With Will working on the covers, Evan started washing the wheels in the prep bay first, then sanded down the scuffs with 320 grit to ensure it was perfectly smooth before painting. After some more cleaning and drying, etc., he powder coated the wheels back in his oven department while Marcos devised a plan for respraying the center caps. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to do this, he attached the cap to the back of his drill and then sanded it by hand to maintain that brushed or circular look, which is pretty clever. A few days later, with the wheels and the covers now repainted, Austin reinstalled everything and torqued it to spec for a brand new look and feel on the GT. The next day after the installation, she arrived back at the studio from yeah. Brewster Ford, and I wanted to give her yet another final wash to make sure that the power washing at the dealership didn't shoot up or dislodge anything from below that now is sitting on top. So I rewashed once again. Okay, at this point, now I am 100% sure that it's clean and dry. I then installed Reflex Pro 2 coating to the perfect paint. For the wheels, I did the same thing, but instead I used Gillet Pro wheel coating, which has five times the amount of solids designed for higher heat resistance and rigidity that you don't necessarily want on your paint, so it's designed specifically for wheels. For the faded and dried out trim, I used Frame Pro trim coating, and the before and after was just night and day. It looked absolutely amazing when we were done. Then I finished up with the glass, I added some mud dressing to the new rubber, and she was ready for a new home. But first, I wanted to show Doug DeMuro the massive transformation. Check nice to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. No there worries. it is. The Ford GT. Way different, right? Way different and so beautiful. This is the color combo that I always wanted. And yours is what? Mine is the opposite. Mine is blue with the white stripes, but I always thought it looked better in this. It was like the color in my mind. I and this one looks so much nicer than the it The wheels. Remember we talked about this? Yeah. Totally they were really refinished. rough. They were like corroding. Yep. All this got refinished. Yep. Looks a thousand times better. Yeah. The yeah. paint polished up the paint. Yeah. That was, that's a given here. But the interior, now this thing smelled a little bit and I showed you some mold in there. Yeah. Totally gone. It was like mold like up here. Yep. Yeah. We wow. disassembled everything, put it back together. Did you just clean it or did you have to replace stuff? Or? No, we cleaned up in here, but all of this we took out and cleaned underneath the seats oh. and underneath the floorboards. How bad well. was it under the seats and the floorboards? It was pretty, uh, it was pretty dirty. It yeah. just was neglected. Yeah. Uh, the story goes, the, the, the gentleman, uh, he passed away and his son uh, has inherited all of this and he's a really good guy and he's like listen I want to do the right thing by this car but obviously our priorities changed when our father passed right, away etc right. et it totally makes sense and he said what can we do to get this back into perfect condition 
and then get it to a new home where someone's going to appreciate it. And I said, we can totally you do that. You took it to the right place. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> in the engine, obviously, we, we changed all the fluids and everything from the fuel filter to the air filter. Yeah, this looks so much better because this was like flaking or corroding yeah, yeah. also. And there was like pine straw and leaves yeah, in there. Yeah. I mean, the stuff that we pulled out was crazy, but totally normal or typical yeah. for sitting outside for yeah, this amount of years. Yeah, of course. New tires, you see. New tires, yeah, that was a big one. Yeah. And so I had it flatbedded here and we haven't driven it since. So yeah. with all of that in mind, I wanted to go for a ride with you in the car. But before we do that, real quick, what are the steps to put this on Cars and Bids? Because he's really crazy about getting it on the website. Yeah, I can't wait to have it on the website. Uh, go to carsandbids.com. Yes. And then there's a, there's a button that just says, you know, sell a car. And there's, it's a very simple process to submit a car. We made it easy. You do like five minutes. It's just a few simple questions like VIN, mileage, uh, a couple pictures, just so we can take a look at it. And then once we have accepted it, there's the next step is just like take good photos. Yeah. You know how important like professional like high photos, quality yeah. for a car like this. Yeah. That is, and we write up the listing, and usually once we get everything from a seller, we can get a car listed within three to five business days. So it's a pretty quick turn. And I can't wait to have this on the site. This is gonna be pretty cool. <laughs> but we do need to go for a drive. Yes. Are you ready? Yeah, I am. I'm pumped. I mean, I love mine. I drive mine, it's basically every day. Yeah. Have you driven one of these before? I've, I've driven one when they first came out. I had a customer and he was all excited and I got to drive it. I have a thousand photographs. This was like my poster <laughs> car, you know, yeah. on the wall. Mine too. Mine I got too. the books, I got the whole thing. I was like, man, if I ever win the lottery, this is like a thing. I so, and it was actually this color too. I have pictures of me like sitting there scrubbing. I took my wife on a, a weekend back in the day. Uh, you know, you, you got to drive up and go with a crazy thing and I pretended it was my car and the whole <laughs> nine yards. So, so but this was, that was 20 years ago, like when it was when a brand it new first car. came out. I think it was like 2006, 2007. You yeah. know, this was in 2005. So it was like yeah. a year or two old. Yeah. It was a real big deal for me. So, so you I, haven't driven one and you haven't driven this one. I yet. haven't driven this one yet. I wanted to change everything and then I said, make it perfect. What, what, what better than to go for a drive with Doug? Cool. All right. Well, let's do it. I'm pumped. All right. <laughs> there's a storage compartment if you didn't get the stereo, but if you did, there's not one. So you're just screwed. So that third thing is clutch, you said? What's that? Yeah, the, the clutch. It's not an extra brake pedal. <laughs> the thing about this car that I love the most is that it's so usable. Uh, I've never had any problems with mine. I've done 10,000 miles in my car. I've met 41,000 miles. And um, I've never had any issues. And I just drive it everywhere. I take it to the store. I take it to everywhere you could possibly drive a car. I drive mine. And I just love it. And that's the cool thing. I also like, like you mentioned, we're two big guys, like tall guys in this car, but like you fit, like it's okay. It's not like some super. Yeah, they have like cutouts here. They have too. cutouts like, in the doors. Yeah. Like that. It's not like some exotic cars where you're like this and it's yeah. a total compromise. I've always felt that was a nice thing about this car. I always tell people it was made for Americans. And indeed, you can be big, you yeah. can be tall, you can be whatever. What do you think about the seats though? Why do they put the holes in the back? I never understood that. You get it out of the heritage sweaty. thing, was it? But like, Weird, yeah. right? Like a weird. Like I have these pop marks in my back after a long right. drive. You know? I don't find them uncomfortable, um, but it's weird. It's definitely would be more, a little more comfortable if it was just a seat. Yeah. If it just had cushions instead of plastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. All right. But it's nothing like an Atlas. That's all I have to say. Atlas Crossport. Yeah. Don't sell my Atlas short. That's yours? No, it's a rental car. I think it's the door, man. How many times have you taken your head off on this door? I ain't gotten used to it, but it's horrible. It's yeah, so annoying. Man. And I, bought, I, I, one time I met the designer of this car, Camilla Pardo, and he was like, I had to fight engineering so hard to make sure we could keep those doors. And I was like, dude, why, why did you do that? To find out more info on this and all of Doug's cars for sale, visit carsandbids.com. Now, I'll put a link down below to check out the Ford GT specifically, but if you have a car that needs to be restored and needs to find a new home, you can always reach me at larry at ammonyc.com. As always, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.